You know, tonight's episode is extra special. Spared no expense. Yeah, what up? And uh, Don Allen is absolutely positively lying to you like an asshole. Yeah, what up? Cause this is my United States or whatever. And this is my United States or whatever. I don't really mean that. I just, you know. I think you do. But it's okay. This is like a more epic intro than we've ever had before. Yes, very. The French horn makes it... It just makes it even more special than ever before. So, uh, sad news to report tonight. Kind of sad. I mean, he, he was old. He, yeah. he lived a full life, which is which is comforting to know. But, uh... Just knowing that there's a new a new film in the franchise coming out is it next year I think. Uh, yeah. It's kind of somber to announce that Rich, Richard Attenborough from uh, Jurassic Park, the old man John Hammond, spared no expense. I wonder if they're gonna do that for his funeral. Spare no expense. But uh, uh-huh. he's responsible for the creation of the park, right? And everything yeah. eventually going awry. And learning the lesson the hard way that you can't control life because it somehow uh, uh, finds a way. Finds a way, yeah. <laughs> so I love this. I, I, this good theme song. I have a feeling they'll, they'll maybe do, uh, put the new movie to him. Yeah, they'll probably dedicate it to him. You know, originally, like when I first saw the news, I thought it was David Attenborough, the yeah. uh, the nature documentary narrator, and I was even more torn up. And then I, then I was like, oh, Richard Atten. Okay, well. <laughs> you know, I didn't. You know, I'm not, not as familiar with any of his other work other than Jurassic Park. So. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Godspeed, good sir. Thank yes, you for bringing Godspeed. us a uh, memorable character. And he had good intentions. Yeah. You know, he wanted to have a fun theme park for kids to enjoy and families to take their kids to. And you would have appreciated his 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 vision there, Justin. I would have went to his park. Yeah, exactly. But. It was a Michael Crichton book, and those never end well. Yeah. Anyway. Um, and Michael Crichton's gone, too, huh? He is, yeah. Yeah, that's sad. Shame. I know. Things just... Why, why did we start this away. episode on a sad note? So, um, well, you know, <laughs> pay, pay tribute. Uh, yes, that's true. And also, even sadder news, the uh, Video Music Awards are going on right now as we speak on MTV. So, mm. uh, yeah. Ugh. I didn't even it's all know. Over my, it's all over my Twitter feed right now. It's disgusting. Anyway... Uh, how you been? You have a good week? Yeah, I had a great weekend, man. Um, saw Guardians of the Galaxy, right. uh, and uh, finally. also finally got around to seeing The Lone Ranger, and so yeah, I had a good Lone weekend. Lone Ranger? Yeah. The movie? Yeah. Oh, with Johnny Depp? Yeah. Oh, cool. I haven't seen that. I haven't seen either of those movies. Uh, huh. speaking of uh, movies that opened recently, uh, well, those weren't too recent, but the most recent one this week was uh, Sin City 2, which I think a lot of people were looking forward to. But they didn't really prove it with box office receipts. I saw it's expected to pull in just six million dollars this weekend, which is pretty bad. Uh, I don't know what I think the first one did. I don't know seven, eight times that, something like that. And you know, the first one it set the world on fire. I think it ended somewhere seventy to eighty million total domestic or something like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, which is I that's, find it- that's still the highest grossing Robert Rodriguez movie ever. I think, but. That's I just find true. it interesting because, like, okay, when the original came out, yeah, uh, I mean, it did, it did, it had a good cult following to it. Mm-hmm. it I just did. think sadly that cult forgot all about it now and <laughs> cult. <laughs> this is literally a cult following. The cult just didn't go. Now that's the thing is, you know, it was new and fresh the way that uh, Rodriguez did the first movie. You know, with the green screen, all green screen. Not, like the actors weren't even in the same room a lot of times, and. um I don't know, like, I, I think a lot, you know, a lot of movies are done like that now, practically, um, and it's just, it's kind of lost its luster. I don't know if, I don't, like, you, you said to me you didn't even know it opened this No, weekend. I did, seriously, I I had no idea it was being, I mean, I kind of heard mumbling that it was yeah. being made a while back, but I had no idea it, wasn't, it was even coming It out. wasn't as anticipated as I think it would have been had it come out five years ago, instead yes. of, because it came out, the first one came out ten years ago now, came out 2004, if you can believe that, and um, I don't know, like, I don't, 
I think you not knowing that it was coming out was, you know, they didn't market it that well, <laughs> obviously. Yeah, I don't think it was a lot of people. Yeah, a lot of people didn't. I guess they just kind of, you know, his his movies have low budgets because uh, I'm sure everyone listening is familiar with Robert Rodriguez's style. He, he, he like, prides himself on shooting everything himself. And he, yes. in his credits to his movies, puts shot, chopped, and scored by Robert Rodriguez. So he does pretty much everything himself. He's like a one-man band almost. And uh, he has his own studios and his home in Austin, Texas. And uh, it's literally in his garage, practically, you know. And uh, he, he, he doesn't have to leave home. And instead of, you know, going and building a set and being on set for three months in Hollywood, he hates Hollywood. I read, you know, I've read his book called Rebel Without a Crew. And he, has, he hates Hollywood. He loves living in Austin, Texas. That's his home. So he, he stays there. And what he does is he has these big-name celebrities, you know, Bruce Willis, uh, Jessica Alba, you know, Mickey Rourke. All these people are in Sin City. And normally they would cost, you know, however many millions of dollars, right? Yeah. But what he does is he flies them in to Austin, you know, on their own schedule, on their availability. And because he's able to piece their roles together without having them in the same room a lot of times, they'll just come in whenever they whenever they can for like a couple of days, do their part, and then leave, you know? And then he'll <laughs> then he'll edit it together and... It comes out as a much cheaper movie. Um, I remember in his book, he, he talks about this movie that he shot killed, uh, called uh, El Mariachi. And El, Mar- yeah. El Mariachi was like the first, uh, it was the prequel to Desperado. You know, it was yes. later taken over by uh, Antonio Banderas, the role. But the first one he, he, Antonio. The first one he shot for a total of $7,000. The entire movie he shot for $7,000. And uh, there's a there's a great part in the book where he's talking about like cutting his own trailer because they wanted him to like send the the footage off you know to some company that would cut a trailer together for him. And he said like, oh, he he, he got on the phone one day with one of the executives in Hollywood, and, and this is in like 1992 or three. And he says uh, he says, yeah, he's like, so how much did it cost you? And he's like, well, it cost me about seven thousand dollars. And he's like, oh, that's great. He's like, a trailer is usually twenty, twenty-five thousand, somewhere around there. He's like, no, the whole movie cost me seven thousand dollars. And the guy's like, what? <laughs> so that's just that's how he became known, and that's what he's known for. But so six million dollars is still pretty low for one of his movies, even. So yeah, I don't know. It's it, I think it's kind of a shame. I guess it got kind of middling reviews. I didn't see it yet, but it just has. Um, but the Straight first one DVD written all over it. I don't know. The first one had you know the same kind of reviews, um, and I just I don't know that it's any worse off than the first one. I just gotcha. uh, it's ten years too late, I guess. You know, people wanted the sequel a long time ago. I think right around when Blu-ray became a thing, a big thing, because that's a kind of, you know the digital kind of movie looks amazing yeah. in high def, and that was the kind of movie people wanted to see around that time. You know, and 1080p was becoming a big thing with home theater and whatnot. Now not yeah. so much. So I mean, it's hard for a series to come back so many years later. Yeah. And 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 get get, get that appeal still, and especially I just think if you if your first movie isn't like a smash hit, it's it's not gonna have the same effect. I mean, like if Goonies was made now with the same cast, people would probably flip their crap and 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 would go rush to see it, or or like Ghostbusters three. I mean, established. Mm-hmm huge movie so to speak from the 80s or whatever but you take a movie from like five ten years ago and it's like eh, we've got a good following but nothing crazy and and nah, nobody cares to see the sequel yeah it was like it was kind of a cult hit whenever it was released and i think most of the money it made was just from people uh i don't i don't know that there's a lot of there's a huge faction of people out there just you know trying like waiting for a sin city movie you know what i mean but I think they were just kind of intrigued because of the way he shot it, the way it was all digitally yeah. done. Just um, like 300. Yeah, exactly. And and also, just like 300, he shot it pretty much uh, kind of frame for frame out of the graphic novel, you know, and he kept yeah. it su- like super faithful to the actual source material. So that was another thing that I think people were interested in. But the second time around, I don't know. Like it's kind of flew under the radar. A lot. Of I mean, people did didn't even know did there. three did the three hundred sequel even really do that well? I don't think it did. Did I? Don't think so. I don't think. Yeah. It did. I don't think it did nearly as bad. But I don't. I don't think it did. You know, as well as the first one. I might be totally like, wrong though. My name's Frank Miller, and I make these cool things, and I'm not going to make sequels. Well, to talking about Frank later. Miller, he seems like he's gone off the deep end lately with some of the stuff yeah. he's been saying. I don't know. He's he, I don't know. People are saying he seems kind of old and angry, but who knows. I think when you're old and and you've had a lot of success, you have the right to kind of be old and angry. I he he did 
I, I, who was it that asked him the other day something about what he thinks of uh, Christopher Nolan's Batman? And he was like, that's not Batman that I know. I don't know. I don't know what that is. So he doesn't <laughs> like the movies. But then, you know, a few like 10 years ago, he did an interview with IGN right after Begins came out. And he said that he loved it. And it was one of the greatest, <laughs> like one of the most faithful uh, uh, interpretations of his version of uh, Batman that he'd ever seen as far as um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Gary Oldman's character, Gordon. He's like, that's that's Lieutenant Gordon from from Batman Year One that I wrote. I love that, you know, that that thing they put in there. And it's like, okay, so change your tune. That's cool. But whatever. Hey man, he's he's made some some great stuff over the years. So you, like I said, you earn the right to kind of be crabby after a while. Yeah. Well, some people were saying they think he might be sick too. Mm, like actually, right. like sick because he like doesn't have any hair. It looks like really. Yeah. That's depressing. And we are glad we could lift you guys' spirits this evening. Um or morning or whenever you're listening. Thank you. Uh but anyway, so transition a little bit into this. Uh this was kinda where I was headed with this, being horror related at least. Uh Robert Rodriguez, of course. You know what this song this is songs from, right? Oh yeah. yeah. All right, so this is uh, from Dust Till Dawn, uh, the soundtrack. Yep, yep. Music from the motion picture, which came out in 1996, 18 freaking years ago, if you can believe it. That's crazy. Uh, I remember seeing it in theaters when I was, what, 13? And I, it was one of the most mind-blowing films of the time for me. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so back in March, I think it was, um, there was a network called El Rey that launched... Here in the states, it could have launched at a different time. But I just know that the show launched with the network, I believe, and it's from *Dust Till Dawn* the series, and uh, it was exclusive in the states, I think, to the El Rey channel, uh, and it was on Netflix worldwide weekly, uh, but not here in the states. And just this past week, it got put entirely in the states on Netflix, so we can watch the entire season now. Uh, so I started watching it today, actually. I watched the first four episodes. That doesn't mean it's great that I watched four episodes. It means I had nothing to do. Um, <laughs> no, but uh, it's interesting because it's basically the movie dragged out into ten one-hour episodes of television. And, gotcha. kind, and kind of added to a little bit, you know. And it, But it focuses on Seth and Richie, the Gecko Brothers as they're known, and... and it's you know completely different cast obviously uh but it's interesting to see i guess the padding and whatnot and the kind of extra i didn't see the second and third uh from dust till dawn movies did you ever watch those no i did not but uh i don't know so i don't i'm not even sure what like if this kind of took place in those movies but they have this story that they've expanded on now you remember Tarantino, uh, his character in the movie was like sick, you know, he's like mentally deranged, mm-hmm. and in this, he basically is kind of corrupted by supernatural force, and he can see, like he he can sense the the vampires and whatnot around him, and it's just really weird. But they actually gave a little bit more depth and meaning to him being like kind of deranged than gotcha. just him being a weird rapist, you know? So Yeah. Um, so that's where the he- that's where the series is headed as far as, like, the first half of the season goes. But it's it's weird seeing a series knowing what's going to happen, you know? Because you know where it's going. You know it's going to the yeah. Titty Twister bar. And it's not really, like, R-rated stuff. It's, I mean, it's gory, but it's not... There's not... They don't say fuck a lot. They don't... There's not a lot of boobs, you know? So it's just weird so far. It's like a made-for-TV Tarantino of, yeah. movie, but it's like, wait, uh, a Tarantino movie for TV? I know. It's like, wait, is that possible? Well, they, I don't yeah. think they green light that. I think it's rated TV-14, too, which is kind of strange. Uh, but apparently in the past couple, last couple episodes of the season, they got some topless women and stuff once again in the bar, but... It's just, it's kind of strange so far, but it's interesting because, like I said, all the characters are the same from the movie. They're just different actors, and the actors are basically doing impersonations of the original characters. <laughs> so you have, like, the main guy playing Seth, a.k.a. George Clooney, and he's basically speaking like George Clooney would, like, you know, rattle off the lines in the movie. 
and he's just yeah. doing a George Clooney impression, which is okay. Like he's just, it's not a bad impression, but it's still just not George Clooney, you know. Yeah. It's hard to talk that's, Clooney in that movie anyway. Yeah, but. that's that, that's interesting. Definitely. But um yeah, so that's where that's where I am right now in episode four. Uh, episode five, I think I think they get into the, the bar uh, at the end of episode five from what I read, but I'll uh, keep tabs on that. I'll let you guys. That's know. interesting. I, you know, speaking of yeah. uh, shows, mm -hmm. I'm, I've been watching. Uh, I'm, I'm behind this. I'm behind the curve, but I've been watching season two of American Horror Story. Oh yes, please do tell. I'm behind uh -oh. on that show too. I'm not. I'm not yeah. up to speed on a lot of things right now. Uh, well, I mean, you know, the premise is basically each season is a different story with different right. characters, but this, similar actors or actresses. This and, most um, recent season, I think, is called Asylum. Is that right? So well, it's, season two is Asylum. Season, season three is, Asylum. is The Coven. Okay. And then season the, that's over now, and the next the so next season is going to be called Freak Show. Okay, cool. So the next season the next season is a Stephen King book. Yeah, exactly. It's hmm. The Shining. Um, <laughs> But uh, it's it's really good actually. Season two is really good. I watched season really one. Really well done. I watched season one. I wasn't a huge fan. I'll just be honest. I don't know. Season two, I think, is much better. I liked season okay. one until the very end. I, I thought they didn't end it very well. Mm -hmm. um, but season two throws a lot of stuff, and it's I think season two is great. And most people I've talked to that's seen all three so far say season two is their favorite. Really? Okay. So just watch so, season two. Is what you're saying? Yeah, or at least you should watch these. <laughs> Ignore too. the other two, because they're no good and they're terrible and they shouldn't exist at all. When you say something, uh, when you say something is not that good, it basically means it's one of the worst things ever invented. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Who are you? I don't. I have no idea what I'm talking about. I don't even know oh, what yeah. that meant. Um, Justin's very. No, no. He's he's positive about a lot of things. That's I am. I'm. Uh, You're very Don forgiving. Is the You're year very forgiving for my person. yang. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I'm 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 Captain Cynical <laughs> and you're Captain Optimism, which is great. Yes. It's fine. So, yeah, but that's what makes our show so great. We have two discerning opinions, but we still agree on a lot of things. Just yeah, we do. We come together in the middle. You just take a different approach to things that I do. And and sometimes we pretend fight. That too. Yeah. On Twitter. You're tearing me apart, Don. You gotta you gotta follow us on Twitter to see all this madness go down, because that's where it happens a lot of times. That is. It's fun though, because we just kind of like take jabs at each other. I take jabs at uh, at other people a lot too, and that's one of the things you have to know. If you guys if you guys follow us on on Twitter, uh, I'm super sarcastic, so I will try to get a rise out of you, knowing that it's out gonna, of anybody, it's yeah, gonna piss you off. Yeah, I'll I'll say a lot of things that I just don't actually mean. Just, just because I know I shouldn't be saying them, and I think that's ultimately going to going to cost me in the end. <laughs> like some some potential employer in the future or something will look at my Twitter account and they're like, "Oh my God, really? This guy's a Nazi," you know? And I'm like, "No, no, no, no. It was a joke. I was just trying to piss people off. Never mind." <laughs> but you know, that's just how it, it works. Work? Well, it work? That's you got to take your lumps, man. You're gonna be like, you know, a complete dick like I am most of the time. You got to come to terms with it. So. But, um, yeah, it's it's true, though, like you said. You are lying. I never hit you. You are tearing me apart, <laughs> Lisa. I like the, uh, <laughs> the, the abundance of uh, references we make to this movie because it's just it never, ever gets old. <laughs> chicken, Peter. You just a little chicken. Cheep, 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 cheep. <laughs> I, I probably think about The Room at least so one time a day. Not so gonna good. Lie. This is the best movie ever made because of these clips. Not because of the movie. The movie yeah. itself is horrible. Oh, my God. If you haven't seen it, don't. Don't even watch it. Just listen to, hi, our, doggy. Listen to our clips. I don't even have that oh. clip. Do I? Oh, hi, Mark. I have that one. I did not hit her. It's not true. It's bullshit. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. <laughs> well, that's, hi, Mark. That's my that's my PSN um, little catchphrase. Yeah, and if you oh. missed this show too, by the way, uh, go back and check out our best of because I've uploaded them. You know, as like individual clips where you don't have to listen to the whole podcast just to find them. So I think this one's on our on our YouTube, but you can go back and listen to a lot of this stuff. Ballet's here. A crazy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you, Blaze. <laughs> this oh, is gosh. this is a movie called New Year's Evil that we watched back on, back at New Year's. Go figure. Who would have who would have ever guessed that f for the theme of the show? But uh, yeah, it, it was pretty bad. 
uh, and we both watched it, and we kind of riffed on it. I played those clips. So go is that check when it we out. started getting back into this? Was that was uh, we? Our first show was December twelfth, twenty thirteen. Okay. Yeah. And then we then we went on a little pause. Yeah, we had. We? Yeah, because I had I had a, the new job and all this stuff. That's right. I was finishing up school, and then uh, we we came back around May. I think it was April. Yeah, like that was like the April. summer. Yeah, and then uh, now here we are, uh, kind of tormenting listeners now on bloodyspicy.com. Cool. See you later. <laughs> later, peace. Whatever. And we're back. So, uh, what else do we gonna what are we gonna talk about? I don't even remember. So this is how, this is how well put together our show is. We literally <laughs> oh, oh. in the middle of recording go, "What was another topic?" Um, Shut up. Yes. I was gonna say <laughs> we were gonna talk. <laughs> we were gonna talk about uh, Phil Fish fiasco. Oh right, right. Okay. So intro Phil Fish for people that don't know who he is, because I Phil, I have Phil a feeling he thinks a lot of people know who he is when they don't. Yeah, actually, Phil Fish, if you say it really fast, kind of gets Phil Fish, Fizz, Finney. But Phil Fish made Phil Fish. Fez, um, he indie developer for Polytron, a company he made. And basically, after he made that game, um, he had a tissy fit on Twitter, said he's not making Fez 2 anymore, deleted his Twitter, whatever, disappeared for a while. Um, so now we bring us back up to today. And uh, according to most people, for, for what I can tell, his Twitter is gone yet again. Knows it really. Now, yeah, for I, heard those of you, I heard it's gone again. Just an aside, for those of you who want to know who Phil Fish is, uh, check out a movie called Indie Game the Movie. It's on Netflix, I think. Um, he's one of the three people they profile in there. Well, four yes. people, but one of the three developers they profile in that movie. And uh, you either love him or hate him. That's pretty much it. That's pretty much his his thing. And I don't think, you know, he's he's not intentionally like he is. You know what I mean? It's just how he is. So. Anyway. He just he just has a hot lip. He does. He he kind of flies off the handle and says some things he shouldn't. And yeah. and, and unfortunately, kind of because of that, I mean, gosh forbid, it, we do have the freedom of speech on the internet. But um, I I don't know all the details. But basically, some people hacked into his personal stuff. He got doxxed. Uh, he got doxxed yeah, by, yeah. by Reddit. And but explain they, that. Explain what that is. Doxing is uh, doxing is when people literally like hack you and and find all of your personal documents and and information and things like that and then they post it online for the world to see in you know not so cool fashion because they're just being dicks because they don't like how you talk or how you look or whatever and uh did all of his personal info get put on his website i think i i, I don't know all the details but i, I could have swore i was I reading something about his bank account like getting that. cleared yeah, out exactly yeah so some some stupid immature morons on the internet took things way too far Again, as per usual, and uh, this is why we can't have nice things, because yes. people like this like to overreact to stupid people like Phil Fish that say things and do things that they might not need to be doing and saying, and there you go. Then you have things taken way too personally. It's it's really sad that this kind of stuff happens, and it's one of the reasons, like, honestly, like, I'm, you know, it makes me hesitant to, to want to do stuff. Like, okay... I did that video for Bloody Disgusting from the horror convention from Monster Rama yes. last month, right? Really good video, too. Thank you. Uh, this coming weekend, this next weekend, before our next show, uh, we'll be at Dragon Con in Atlanta doing the same thing. But this time, it's a much bigger convention. It's uh, the, the, the last one we went to was one, one hotel. This one is five. Okay, so this one's a huge yes, convention. 60,000 people are attending. It's... That's literally, I think, half as big as Comic-Con in San Diego now, but still, it's pretty big. It just makes me kind of hesitant to put myself out there like that because I don't want to get doxxed. I don't want people coming up and, you know, because I, like I said, I'm, I'm an asshole intentionally on Twitter, but I'd love, I'd love for people to kind of get it, you know? <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not having to worry about this kind of stuff, you know? And it's not cool when it happens because, you know, I mean, it's video games for Christ's sake. I don't yeah. get it. I really don't get it. I really don't get why... There's such serious business to a lot of people. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense to me. So. Yeah, well, it, it's it's kind of scary. Yeah. Like, I, I feel like ga the gaming community uh, and has really just kind of taken a turn for the worse. I mean, they've they've been kind of building up, but th it, lately I feel like it's been really bad. It's and it's just ahead. interesting because I don't. I mean, maybe it happens, and I just don't know it. But I don't feel like. Uh, people that read books do this to authors. I don't feel like people <laughs> that do this to, to directors of movies. I mean, well. I think movie directors are kind of exempt from it because they're kind of shielded. They're, you know, Hollywood's kind of like a different place. It's like a, it's like a different planet, kind of shielded off from the rest of the world. You know what I mean? They all have publicists and things like that, and that's where you know 
getting in touch with them personally is really hard a lot of times. Uh, somebody like Phil Fish, you know, he probably just, just like a normal guy. Just kind of lives in, you know, lives out in the world, like, you know, in small town. I don't know where he's from, but, you know, he doesn't have, you know, like an entourage and all that crap that, like, yeah. Hollywood celebrities have. And he's not really a celebrity. He's a gaming celebrity, which is kind of, you know, ridiculous in and of itself. But still, it's it's just it's a totally different kind of beast i guess it's a a different thing but like he's much more vulnerable to this kind of thing i feel i think what what really just irks me in general is that you know games are not easy to make right and they take a lot of time regardless of even if they're not great games they they take time for for the art the programming all that and like i just feel like so many people don't get that they don't appreciate it he's like a one-man band pretty much you know i think he had one other guy helping him with fez at the time, you know, and he did, he did a lot of it himself, and uh, he's a real small company. It's like less than five people, I think. So he's, you know, you're talking about how hard games are to make and put out there, especially when you got just you and a couple of people. You know, yeah. it's it's even harder. So, you know, he should just he should at least get some respect for that because he at least got his game out, and it it was a pretty long road getting it released to begin with. Yeah. Um. The it's... other thing is, yeah, I take that approach with pretty much anything. Like, you know. Being somebody that reviews something, right? Um, I'll, you know, I, I don't yeah. get paid for reviews. They just, I just do them for fun. But I still try to respect the the fact that, that it even got made as a movie, you know, because yeah. like I like I was, I've said it before on the podcast. Like, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm not, you know, totally in the loop on how hard it is to get a movie distributed, but I, I have some idea that I know, I know firsthand that it's hard to make a movie. Okay, just the movie making process itself. Then you got to, like, edit it. Then you got to, you know, get it all done and, and shown around wherever you're going. You got to go to the festival circuit and show it off to potential distributors. Then you have to impress somebody with it, which is really hard, you know. There's a lot of competition. Yeah. You have to get it picked up, and then it has to go through a distribution process. It's a really, really hard thing to do. It's really a lot of work. There's a lot of bureaucracy. There's a lot of, you know, hoops you got to jump through. And at any point... I always think like, well, I don't have a movie released, you know, like, so yeah, I mean, exactly. at least they did that much and I can't. So I give them that much credit at least. So I'll at least give them a one out of a five usually, but <laughs> I was, that was me being a dick again, but yeah, see how that works. Yeah. It, <laughs> but, and we just lost all our listeners. Yeah, sorry about that guys. Better luck next week. Yeah. Peace. Whatever. Oh, sorry, I dropped the mic. Oh, I was like, man, um, did you? He literally yeah, mic dropped. I mic dropped. But uh, yes, anyway, that's just that's the approach I take. Like you were saying, it's tough just to be in the industry. Well, alone. you know, it, I want to compare it to kind of like, okay, if you ever work retail, yes, anybody that ever works retail, if you've worked in it long enough, I'm not talking a couple weeks, a couple months for holidays, but if you've ever worked retail for a couple years. When you go into retail, sometimes like you kind of understand where that person's coming from if they're having a bad day, right? Or, or you know, you might be like, "Oh, I'm gonna put this back on the shelf." Oh, we'll just put it right there. No, I'm gonna go put it back where it was because I, I know I was pissed off when somebody did that to me. And so it's like, you know, most people don't make video games, so they don't understand or have the knowledge or want how to know and understand exactly how much time and effort and sweat and blood gets put into making a game. I like, so to uh, them, it's like, whatever. I like not too long ago, there was an article. I can't remember what site it was from, but it said the problem with game developing costing so much is developers get paid too much. And I literally sat there and I was going, <laughs> do you realize how much, how many hours these guys put into their job? You have oh, yeah. any More idea? Than 40 hours a week. Too. I've never worked in game development, and I know that that is a job I don't want to do because of the crunch time involved the pressure you're under, the instability of the industry. It's crazy. It's absolutely nuts. And you know why they do it? Because they love it. Because they love it and they have a passion for it. And that's what you got to have the beat and do that stuff in that industry. It's not unionized. They, you know, there, there's turnover out the ass. I mean, they literally, you know, they'll, they'll get let go after a project. That's just part of the, part of the industry. You finish a game, you're getting somebody's getting dumped, you know. Yeah. It's like you, you I mean, got to look forward to another job at some point. I mean, let, let's take it on a smaller scale here. When I made that Alan Wake video, mm-hmm. 
you know, I I I rented out that uh, cabin with my buddy. We split the cost. We split the cost for driving. It was six hours away. Right. We, you know, we split the cost for food. It was the the most money I've ever spent on a video, and it, and it's a shame because like you know, it didn't get really watched by but a thousand something people, and it, and it was like really hev- heavily edited and and whatnot. And it's like you know, it's one of those things. It's like it sucks, but it's like you know these. People just don't understand some of the effort, and I like if I was a game developer or somebody who worked on a game, and I put days and months into the product, and then I heard people like shamming on it or not playing it, I'd probably be pretty upset. Yeah, I mean that's the ultimate goal is you just want people to enjoy your work, right? You don't, yeah, you don't really care about like I don't think anybody sets out to be to make movies to be a millionaire. You know what I mean? Like, that's yeah. it's just not it's not like probably for ninety plus percent of the industry, it's not a reality. And so, you know, you have to, you go into it because you love it. And I mean, how many people could work in a factory job and, and do like, you know, everyday kind of thing and have job stability and do all this stuff, but you don't want to because that's not what you're passionate about, right? And you chase yep. your passion and you, you kind of sacrifice uh, a steady living a lot of times. I mean, that. if you're passionate enough and then yeah. you're, you want to shit your pants, then you're going to do that. Exactly. You, you won't make, you won't make nothing from it probably. As a matter of fact, you'll probably <laughs> lose friends from it. But if that's what you really want to do, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's yeah, it's 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 tough. I mean, it's really tough pursuing anything you really are passionate about. A lot of it times, is. is not going to pay off. At least at at first, you're gonna have to you know, work for free. Sometimes you're gonna have Hell, to you know. You see what I'm doing? You hear you hear? You, well, you don't see, but you you've heard. We've discussed <laughs> what I'm doing. Yeah, exactly. Or attempting to do, and it's Plugging taking away. a long time to get any answers. Plugging away. I mean, it's got to have persistence. You got to, yes. got to, you know, stay at it the whole time. You can't like let up ever. You have to completely. A lot of times, you know, if you're bugging people about a job or an idea you have or something like that, they're busy doing other things at their job, so they don't have time to immediately get back to you, and you have to yes. remind them that you wanted, you know, wanted an answer or something like that. Yeah, it's it's. It's almost like a second full-time job a lot of times if you want something in a creative industry actually accomplished. Yes. You know, because it, you have to you have to do promotion yourself cuz a lot of I mean what are you going to hire a PR firm, you know? No, of course not. You're going to have to you're going to have to make the Twitter accounts. You're going to have to set up the Facebook. You're going to have to like go out there on podcasts and do whatever you can to promote your product. Whether it's a movie, you know, like like uh 80 and uh Joe came on last week. You know, that, you know, they, they have, you know, the distribution and stuff, but it doesn't hurt to come on a, on a podcast and promote your own product. You know what I mean? Yeah. They they didn't have to come on, but you know, they were gracious enough to come on and talk about their, their product and they're, they should, they should be proud of it. You know, it was a good movie, but that's just like, you know, that's an example of the, the, these guys are actually making movies and actually on a regular basis, you know, like I know 80s, they they were scoring a movie last weekend. You know, they have another movie ready to go, ready to go. And like they're still, you know, sitting there retweeting every review and in like following the, the sales and stuff like that and, and retweeting it and trying to get it out there as much as possible. And that's pretty much what you have to do. And no matter what stage in, in your career you are, you always want to be uh, kind of taking the charge and leading for your product, right? Because yep. you're the face of your own business a lot of times. You are. And that's that's kind of where Phil Fish, I guess, kind of, uh, I don't want to say went wrong, but with his attitude, you know, that he that he conveys a lot of times, people think, you know, they they don't know what Polytron is. They know who Phil Fish is, you know. So, like, yeah. whenever they go, Polytron, they go, who? And you go, the, the guy that made Fez. And they go, oh, that douchebag. And you're like, <sighs> okay. Like, I mean, he's just a guy, you know, and he just – he wants to make games for a living and he's just constantly hounded for doing what he loves because he just has a short temper and he's, you know, sarcastic and he says stupid things sometimes. And he has a tendency, I think, to burn bridges with people, like just the consumer. Yeah. That's, that's probably the worst thing I was getting at is, yeah, he's the face of his company, his product. And it's up to you to, you know, your own, your own PR guy for, for the, at least the short term, you know, and, and, to to people phil fish kind of embodies an arrogant prick basically and and you know he probably is one i don't care though because you don't need to go and you know air his laundry out on the internet like that. yeah that's, that's just too far and so um i don't know i just i think it's discouraging like i said to a lot of people 
when something like this happens that would otherwise probably be great for the you know for the uh gaming industry or any other kind of creative industry but it's dis- you know it's discouraging cuz nobody wants their stuff like hacked and and you know you don't want your money stolen from your bank account or whatever happened it's just ridiculous but anyway it's, uh, a, it's a scary age we live in it is you just you have to be mindful though of you know you are the face of your company and you have to remember if you're tweeting to somebody and they they troll you and they say hey you piece of shit you know blah 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 you have to act professional yeah you, you just can't. look the other way it's the yeah. internet step up off the computer right. who cares because it's literally data because if you don't, you're going to be doxxed. So yeah. <laughs> that's pretty it, much it was it. possible. Yeah. But. <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's one of the things that like, I'll, I will tweet things that are just like, you know, stupid and negative and blah, 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 because I think it's funny to see people respond to it and they go, what's wrong with you? Why would you think that? But if somebody says to me, Hey, you suck. I hate your thing, blah, 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 something like that. And I say, well, thanks for watching, you know, because I don't want to get, I don't want to be on that side of somebody's wrong side i don't want to be like the guy that puts down people you know what i mean so i'll be negative and i'll be a dick but i'm not going to be a dick to someone because they watched my stuff and i'm grateful for that and that's all i can ask for you know so um so thanks for watching my stuff guys appreciate it yeah i know i watch it i'm back oh man i'm gonna take a break i want to listen to a message from a sponsor this yeah. is this is actually an, uh, a little bit of an older sponsor, but you haven't you didn't hear it, Justin. You weren't uh, on the uh, podcast when I played it last. I think okay. Adam. I think Adam was filling in for you, and um, I put it up on our uh, page last week. So some people probably already heard it, but uh, it's a parody of a uh, club nightclub. You heard this before? I think you have. Mm. But uh, let's let's hear a message from our fake sponsor. We'll be right back. Come to downtown Atlanta and experience the Southeast's largest nightclub. 16 rooms with 64 dance floors of the most annoying electronic dance music imaginable. <laughs> club Duché. Duché. Featuring top security with German bouncers. You're not getting in here. Come on down to the club experience of a lifetime. Club Duché. Duché. Remember, whatever happens here, you will regret. Thank you, everyone. Please remember, Club Duché. Uh, I think I've been there once. I've been there many times. <laughs> I've been to several different variations of that place. It's quite amusing to go there and just kind of people watch. I'm not a club guy, but my goodness. A lot of people that think they are are also not club guys. <laughs> Let's put it that they way. They are Duchés. <laughs> they, yeah, exactly. They go and they're like, Hey, what's up? Oh, man. They're the Roxbury guys, basically. That's a real thing. The Roxbury guy is a real is a real thing. Um, and it's funny because that's ex- that's actually how Will Ferrell came up with that. He said he was sitting at a bar one night, and there's this guy kind of like looking at every girl, kind of nodding his head to the music, you know, and just he would be turned down by every single woman that he spoke to. And so he was <laughs> like, I think I can do something with that. And there you go. Night at the change. Roxbury. A night at the Roxbury got made. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine coming up with a character of a nightclub of a nightclub guy getting rejected by every woman, and then having it greenlit as a movie? That's, That's crazy. Genius. It's it's insane. I can't even imagine that. Like the kind of clout you must have with whoever you convinced that that was a, a movie worthy idea. <laughs> <laughs> like we're gonna have at least eighty minutes of screen time with this central idea, and you're like, "What?" <laughs> I would be like, "It's brilliant, amazing." But can we go seventy-four minutes or so? Because I saw this horror movie once, and it really benefited from the short runtime. <laughs> but who knows? Um, so yeah. Anyway, um, what else did we talk about? We talked about the uh, the the thing and the thing and a the thing there, another thing and a thing. Uh, there's a couple other things there, but I, I really can't. Uh, yeah, there's a couple other things there, like you know, like a uh, woman that has breast cancer. Everything goes wrong at once. Nobody wants to help me, and I'm dying. You're not dying, Mom. I got the results of the test back. I definitely have breast cancer. Oh, it's so sad. 
definitely has breast cancer. That's another great clip from The Room, for those of you who missed that episode, like I said. <laughs> oh, man. I love that movie. I'm gonna. I'm actually going to go watch it after the podcast, I think. Just to so I got some... kind of wash out the uh, thoughts of Phil Fish being down. Yeah, I, I got something to bring up. It's totally just kind of off the wall random, but uh, if you don't mind. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so have you have you ever noticed gaming habits with yourself changing over time depending on things going on in your life? Sure. I have. Sure? Yes. Now, now let's see. For me, I've always been one of the type that's always tried to play every game, you know? Like, mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, I want to try everything. And that's still there, but I don't have so much time anymore to, to actually do that. Why? Did something um, happen recently? Oh, well, you know... <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> had a kid and I'm married, but no. But the thing is, it's interesting because I, you know, I still have time to play games, and I, I still find time. And of course, it's a, like a hobby of mine mm-hmm. and the whole YouTube thing. But I, I don't see myself wanting to play everything, or or if I do, I, it's like it's like my mind is shifting tracks, and all of a sudden, it's like, oh, I'm only gonna play the things I really want to play because I don't have enough time to hardly play those anyway. <laughs> and everything else can like game fly and can sit on my shelf for a while and you know, on my counter until I return it. It's yes. just it's just interesting. Yeah, no, I what you're talking about. Like I also realized one day that uh I'm waiting for it. Well, never mind. But it's... I mean, I just yeah, you're right. Like I I don't have as much time as I'd like to play a lot of stuff. And the other thing is I'm just not as interested as in a lot of stuff as I was at one point. Um I'll, you know, I'll try out like shooters cuz I'm a shooter guy. I'll yeah. try out like but like JRPGs for example. The last one I played, I can't even remember. I think I tried Xenoblade Chronicles, but I ne- I didn't even get into it. I own the game and I still haven't played it. I haven't even actually opened it. I still haven't a sealed copy. But <laughs> sorry. That's the thing though, you know, it should no, it's have, okay. it shouldn't have skyrocketed to two hundred dollars and then I would have opened it. <laughs> now it's <laughs> now it's so ridiculously valuable for absolutely no reason other than Hey, we're not making any more. You know, then I'm not gonna. I'm not opening it. Sorry. Um, but yeah, I know what you mean because uh, as you get older, you start to kind of look at how much time you put into video games in the past. <laughs> at least I did, and you know, I see that uh, 100 plus hour file on Final Fantasy VII from when I was 16 years old, and I go, you know, that's a week of my life gone into that game, <laughs> and yeah. I can't really do that anymore. Um, especially. You know, I'm looking at, you know, I'm looking at getting a full-time job now and things like that. So it's kind of, you know, that's not going to happen anymore. Yeah. So, well, I mean, the thing is, is again, everything blah. in life takes priorities. No. And, and you, and I think you're constantly adjusting to them. And and I've actually really, really, really significantly downsized my collection. Not because I don't want to stop playing games, but I I started looking at stuff and I'm like, okay, what which of these games and out of that I own. How many of these have I actually replayed, like again oh, or multiple played, times? Yeah. That's a good. Point. And I'm like, and I'm like, okay, Uncharted's. I've played those a few times. Okay, Alan Wake. I've played that a bunch of. Like those games justify owning because I've played them and felt the urge to re-experience them again. Whereas other games, it's like I've got, I played it once and it sat there, and you know what? Maybe it's not. not yeah, not, that's it's not gonna happen. That's why you know I I rebuy Resident Evil Four on every platform it's released on, other than PS360, but. Uh, is because I know I'm going to play the hell out of it every single time I rebuy it. You know what I mean? Like, I've I've already played through the PC version, which came out in February of this year, uh, at least three or four times. You were playing it before we got on the podcast. I was, I yeah. Saw you. I was, so... I saw um, you. But that's the thing. Like, I just I just love the mechanics, and I'll just start it up for a few minutes, you know, and just run through a section of it. Um, and then, you know, I'll just stop and do whatever I was going to do. But it's kind of like a... A break for me you know i can just kind of zone yeah. out at this point because i know the game so well and i can just kind of zone out and play it for 10 minutes and just kind of blow off some steam and then yeah. go back to whatever well, i was and, doing and you know and like there's different games for the people like i even think diablo 3 is going to be one of those games for me like after i beat it it'll be diablo something i can just pop in get some loot be done diablo 3 yeah diablo 3 there's, uh what is it monster hunter I have for Wii U, I just got, and I haven't played that yet. But I heard that that is one of those games that kind of absorbs your time, and you'll just get hooked on it for years. I don't know. Probably not. I'll probably you play it pick once. one of those games. That's the thing. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. That's th- that's why I don't play any MMOs or anything, because Same I, know, I know I'll get addicted to it. That's exactly what I've told people. They're like, well, you don't play WoW? I'm like, no, I don't play WoW, because I won't play anything else if I do. You know, like, you're, you're, like, you're like, wait, you think I'm stupid enough to pay, pay to play? 
Per month. <laughs> that too, yeah, it's pretty silly. But then here I am buying like, you know, fifty, sixty dollar games every month, right? But Well that's the thing. I, I my rule is you can't you can't have both. You can't be somebody who wants to stick up to date with the latest games no. and play an MMO. It just it, it, it costs <laughs> money. You just can't do it. That's probably true. Yeah. Um, it's one or the other. It's it's I don't know. I've never been an MMO guy though. I think the only one I've ever played is like City of Heroes, which was like ten years ago or something. I just tried it out to see what it was like. We're listening to the Di Diablo three theme right now, by the way. But um, I just thought it was which I have ways. been playing a lot of on PS4. So how is it on PS4, by the way? Because I know Seriously, you've been playing, I'm playing it. And it's it kind of relevant to the. I'm playing it on thing. both Xbox One and PS4. Are you really? It's, it's great. That's cool. Yeah, I like that. Uh, Digital Foundry did the thing, and you know what? Wasn't this one of those games that like basically proved Digital Foundry's existence as being kind of worthwhile? Because Digital yeah. Digital Foundry found some some bugs. For, okay, for those of you who don't know what Digital Foundry is, because you're not complete nerds like me and Justin, um, <laughs> it's it's a. Uh, <laughs> did you just like do the Conan O'Brien like yeah yeah like glasses push up like yep <laughs> and I just did. Man, let me tell you something she um so. Uh, <laughs> I can picture him in my mind now, like twiddling his little fingers, going like, "Yeah, you don't understand." Um, but yeah, so Digital Foundry is a it's a it's a section of Eurogamer, the the magazine, and they analyze frame rates and resolution and technical aspects of games. And basically, they'll break it down and say this game has this problem or this game has this problem, and it leads to a bunch of debate that's kind of unnecessary among the gaming community, where everyone goes. No, this game is a better frame rate, so it's a better game overall. It's that uh -uh. right, Rocky? And they go, yeah, it's Rocky Bullwinkle. <laughs> You're like, yeah, it's okay. So anyway, Rocky Bullwinkle are actually part of Eurogamer, but they do uh, technical analysis, and it causes a bunch of uproar because the PS4 is faster and better and stronger. We all know that, so I'm just going to digress. But uh, this one time, they found like some frame skipping issue or, some, or something with the PS4 version of Diablo 3 and they were actually able to tip off Blizzard to the problem and have the game patched day one and the issue fixed completely. So now it's pretty much parity across all systems, right? Yeah, the only the only difference now is that Xbox One version will sometimes dip in the 50s, so really Wah. it's... Yeah, in my opinion, yeah. I think it was worth them going 1080 if it you dips so? in the 50s. Big whoop. Did you play it when it was at 900? No, I didn't. So I don't I mean, even know what I, the I didn't difference get a chance, like. so. But yeah, that's the thing is is apparently the they moved the resolution from 1600 by 900 in the beta to 1920 by 1080 on the Xbox One to match the PS4 version and it when you do that on a system when you do that on a system with fixed specs especially where you can't upgrade it like a PC, uh, it it causes issues. It causes, you know, it it uses more of the system's power obviously. So yeah, high the resolution. frame rate the frame rate kind of dips a little bit at times, but from what I was reading, it's pretty much solid most of the yeah. time. Yeah, so I mean, I, I haven't, to be honest, out of both of them, I haven't noticed hardly anything. So there you go. You're, you can't go wrong with the, the console version of Diablo 3. Nope. A at least on uh, next-gen consoles. Yeah. Current-gen consoles, I'm sorry. I, I fell into the trap there. Uh, but the PS3 version is actually not too bad either. And that one has, they all have four-player co-op, right? Yep, four-player local co-op, which is cool. And you can use a controller, obviously, which actually kind of benefits the uh, play style of, the, of Diablo from what I played. So, anyway, uh, pick up Diablo 3 if you uh, haven't played it yet because it came out uh, 65 years ago on PC. No, it came out, what, two years ago? 2012, uh, I think? Yeah, I think and, it came uh, out around then, yeah. It came, it came out, out, yeah, because it came out when I got back from overseas. Right, so it came out in 2012 on PC. It's always online on PC. There's no offline mode. Uh, you can't use a controller no, no on a PC. No, no uh, dodging. That too. And uh, all that stuff is included in the console version. So honestly, like the console version being 1080p 60fps on current gen consoles, kind of like the definitive experience of the game now, which is kind of weird. Uh, but, you know, didn't they close it? They had an auction house in that game, right? Yeah, and they closed it. They closed it. it because it was ruining everything. Yeah, it was basically like, why do I need to play the game if I can just buy? And that's the thing. I think the game sold like 20 million copies on PC or something like that. So the the fact is like there are people that play Diablo that are so into it that they will spend a ton of money on items in an auction house. Whereas, oh, you yeah. know, a game like Titanfall or something like that, people are kind of broke. So they don't really spend all their money on auction house. No, Diablo is that type of game. Everybody will go, oh, well, I have uh, 
plenty of disposable income because I'm a programmer, you know? And you're like, oh, that's great. I'm not. I deliver food for a living. Fuck off. I'm not playing it. <laughs> uh, so anyway, that's that was one of the main problems with the game, but I think they addressed it, so. All righty then. Um, trying to think of anything else that we needed to cover tonight that we didn't get to. Can't think of much. Can't think of anything. And by, by much of anything, I mean nothing. So that was a roundabout way of kind of buying time and stalling so I could just kind of... Uh, keep on talking and get to this which is not funny it's still not funny by the way a girl she had a dozen guys one of them found out about it beat her up so bad she ended up in a hospital on Guerrero Street <laughs> no it's not funny that's it's not still funny. not funny Tommy sorry <laughs> but I have this one as final fight get out of my house I kill you I bring him in hey, stop it I kill you, you bastard you no good you be strapey you not good you <laughs> You're just a chicken. <laughs> chip, 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 chip. <laughs> You're not good. <laughs> That's my favorite description good. of somebody. Somebody that slept with his girlfriend. You're not good. You you, you betrayed me. You're not good. So he kind of sounds like a like a less buff Arnold. Yeah, I can see that. But he has a better ass than Arnold. Sorry. Um, it's his. I swear to God, I listened to our our conversation about him again, and his 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 rear end is like. It's like a like a rocky face of like a I don't know it's just really really strange. It's really like off putting if you see the movie. It kind of scars in in your mind. You know you know what we need to do. Oh man, what like some kind we, of we need to try to get him on the podcast. Oh god, he wouldn't come on our podcast. Yeah, he would. <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah, yeah why man. not? What is we really talk about him so, all the time. So what are you doing? What are you doing this week? Um. Nothing. Oh, of course you're not. You're Tommy Wiseau. So, would you like to come on the podcast? We also need to get Frank Henenlotter on the podcast, if if at all possible. Back in 2010, we had a, kind of a, a slight obsession with this guy, Frank Henenlotter, who directed some really, really questionable movies. Um, <laughs> just to, to put it lightly, one of which was nice called... Um, if you see in our background image right there on the page, uh, I, I kind of con like compiled uh, a best of... Uh, compilation of, of shows that we did back in the original show in 2010. And uh, one of them was uh, a movie we did called Frankenhooker, which was great. And the other one was Bad Biology. And that was that was discovered by Justin. Um, it was, yes. It's kind of like Columbus stumbling upon the Americas of uh, importance there. But it's one of the most uh, disconcerting movies I think I've ever seen <laughs> still to this day. <laughs> And I still feel like there's a spot in hell for me just having seen it, but... I, I still think it ends perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to go listen to that conversation as well. We have a lot of, like, old stuff. We have plenty of stuff to keep you entertained, basically, for a long while uh, up online, different places. So go check out our uh, Facebook, our, our YouTube. We have, a, we have, like, 18 or 19 hours of content or something like that yeah. up on YouTube. So just go check it out. It's it's a lot of fun stuff. You just got to catch up. That's all. Yeah, just catch up. Um, <laughs> oh, my God. I'm looking at all these these uh, clips that I made from that movie, The Room, and it's just unbelievable. I named them, you know, like what he says in the movie, and that alone just kind of makes me crack up <laughs> because the dialogue is so ridiculous in that movie. Um, but anyway, I think uh, – I think this show has kind of run its course. What do you think? Yeah, I think I so think, too. I think we're I think we're good to go. I think we can kind of get out of here. Uh, so what did you learn tonight, Justin? I learned that uh, uh crap, I forgot his name already. But did he oh. die? Jurassic Park guy. Oh man, you had to bring that back up again. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, but spare no expense. It's just, it's just that when you threw me for it's a loop on that, I wasn't expecting it's it. It's all I can think of every time I hear of of John Hammond. Spare no expense. Yeah, look what it got you. Spend no expense, indeed. But um, but I mean, uh, really, I learned that um, that that we that we want to have uh, Tommy Wiseau on the on the show. Yeah, that, I mean, I think it's pretty much like do. But the thing is, what would I have no idea what the hell to talk to him about? Um, I mean, we'll <laughs> I have a feeling he doesn't either. <laughs> like, and any interview he ever does, I feel like it's just kind of like off the cuff every single time. Like, how do you prepare? <laughs> How do you prepare for that kind of interview? How do you go like, oh, so your movie, uh, yeah, so that was something. <laughs> like, uh, so you got it shot and, and distributed. That, that deserves some, some, some respect, I guess. Um, 
gosh, what did I learn tonight? What did you learn tonight, Don? Oh, Justin, I don't know what I learned. I learned, um, let's see. The VMAs are almost over, hopefully, for good. No, <laughs> there was a there was a big earthquake in California. Did you see that? Yeah, I did. It was the biggest one in 25 years, and it just made me glad I don't live in California. So you guys that do, uh, I feel stay for safe. you, man. Yeah, stay safe, because we need you to uh, to click on our podcast and give us a listen. <laughs> we need we need your number. No, um, no, I didn't really learn anything. What am I? I never learned anything. Am I fucking kidding? All right, so uh, thanks for listening. Like I said, you can uh, check us out on Facebook. It's all whatever podcast. W h a t e v a p o d c a s t. That's facebook.com slash whatever podcast, twitter.com slash whatever podcast, youtube.com. No, I'm just kidding. That's actually not slash whatever podcast, but everything else is. So uh, look us up, like us, share us, love us. Please give us a listen and tell your friends about us. Yes, please. Until uh, next week, Justin, you have any, any parting words? Just don't make me beg. And with that, take care of yourselves and each other. Good night, everybody.